Hi, this is Tim with the Watchbox, and welcome back to Perpetually Patek. I'm here with Brian Goffberg, watch collector and Armory co-founder, Mark Cho. Mark, welcome back. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you as well, Brian. Thank you. Um, so I've been following your collecting for a long time now, and I know that you collect from a wide array of brands, everything from Grand Seiko to FP Journe, um, but that Patek makes up a large portion of your collection. It does, yeah. And, and so I was just wondering, why Patek? What what brought you to the to the brand? I mean, it's Patek, right? It's hard to get away from it. They do really, really wonderful things. In fact, I was I was just seeing a dealer, a great dealer in um, in Tokyo, and he only deals in Patek too. And I'm like, why do you only deal in time only Patek? And he's like, oh, because it's the best. That's like his entire thing. His entire business is just time only little Pateks, which so, is like right up my alley. And so I remember that you you purchased a, a reference ninety six. Yes, and I, did. I think you purchased it though unrestored. Yes, I did. And sent it off to to their restoration shop over in Geneva. That's right. Uh, to complete completely redone. Yes, that's right. And so talk to us a little bit about what that process that looks like and sort of and your methodology between you know in terms of picking out a watch and then sending it off to them to be restored. So. The story behind that was I was looking for a 96 for a long time because you know the, the 96 is such a legendary reference in Patek's history and I wanted a Breguet numeral one and I was searching for years and years and years and finally I came across one uh, that had Breguet numerals and platinum case which is very very rare uh, but the dial was really really in bad condition um, but you know, I was like you know what I'll take a punt on it I might be able to get it for a bit cheaper than what I wanted and like uh, took a punt on it received it Case was fine, movement was fine, it was just the dial had a lot of patination and not necessarily in a nice way. And so I thought, I'm very curious to see what Patek can do with this. Because I'd never sent anything to restoration before. I'd sent things for servicing, it always went fine. And I thought, okay, let's see what happens. So they, they took it in for restoration and they did an amazing job with it, an absolutely amazing job with it. I gave it to the Patek boutique in London mm -hmm. um, and they're like, okay, uh, we have your details and we have the watch now, um, we'll call you. And then two years later, they called me, and they're like, okay, it's back, sir. I'm like, oh, fantastic. It didn't even cost a lot of money, though. Know? It was surprisingly cheap, considering how much they did. Because they, they restored the dial, they, res they gave me a new set of hands that were spade hands, and they gave me a new crown, and they did a little bit of touch-up on the case, but the case was generally like, okay. Now, were the hands requested, or did they say that it was more true to the time? The hands were not requested, they were more period correct. Because actually, there's a little bit of a wrinkle to the story. So actually, this Patek actually came with two dials. The original owner of it actually bought it with two dials. Um, the traditional like stick marker one and the Brigade numeral one. And so it was fitted with the Dauphin hands and the, um, and the stick markers. But I swapped it out for the Brigade numerals. And then once they saw it was the Brigade numeral dial, they're like, okay, well, we've got to give you the right hands too. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And because all of it was in the paperwork, they were like, okay, to provide me the right hands for this dial swap, quote unquote. And that shows a lot of confidence because the old rule of thumb is if you have a valuable vintage watch, the last thing you want to do is send it to a factory restoration center. Mm. They're, they're, people say they'll wreck it, they'll try to, quote, service it like a new watch, they'll replace everything carelessly. Mm. It sounds like a really thoughtful, subtle, and frankly, long-term project was invested in this to do it right at Patek. I think so. I really like that about them. Like, I, I really like how they went back to the period rip period correct hands, for instance. I think that's really important. Mark, one quality I see in your collection is that you seem to like the mid-century, the 1950s, the 1960s, and manual wind watches. Could you talk me through this? Was this a decision or did it just happen? I think it just happened. I mean, there weren't that many automatic Patek watches before the 60s anyways. You know, it was quite a rare thing. Um, and generally, I prefer cases that are quite thin. Uh, I like smaller watches and I like these things to be kind of discreet, like they just disappear under your sleeve. But you know, like everything pre-60s, right? There was so much attention paid to like the typography, the arrangement of the elements on the dials. And even like sometimes you just see these amazing markers that Patek does from time to time, right? And you're just like, wow, what a great shape. For people who like details, I think it's such a kind of cornucopia of like visual pleasures. And you sort of get some of that with the 2555. It's, it's a really cool watch. It's historically yeah. important. It's got a lot of personality. There's a lot of character, the lugs and the bezel. Now, I think it's, it's interesting here that we've got the 4675, which is a watch that's all about the appearance. Now, mm. like many of the anniversary pieces from 2014, we have a solid case back. Mm. So as much as we pretend to be all about the movement, mm. this is a watch that sort of acknowledges that we're, we're really all about the look first and foremost. Yeah. 
Although, you know, what's funny, I think, about chronographs, right, is that because you're going to actuate it, you sort of get a little bit of the sense of the movement just from physically, like, interacting with it. It is. There is a sensual quality to a yeah. chronograph that you only get a little bit winding a conventional watch. The mm. chrono, especially a column wheel chrono like that, is really crisp. Mm. Uh, could you kind of walk me through why you chose that over the 5975, which is like the bigger version of yeah. the triple scale? We can call it the men's version of the triple scale. You Please, feel free to call it the men's version. Um, I... I have small wrists, right? And uh, I just don't find it fits me. And I've come to this point in my life where I'm just like, you know what, if it doesn't physically fit me, I don't really want to own it anymore. I don't want to waste any more of my time on stuff that physically doesn't fit me. I come from a background of clothing and it's like, Brian, I'm not gonna sell you a size 54 because that's absurd, right? I'm gonna sell you things that physically fit you. And, uh, I, I think the same goes for watches. Like when I wear watches that I feel physically don't fit me, it makes me very uncomfortable. Like I get kind of distracted by it, not, not in a good way. I like my watch to be part of everything I'm wearing and part of my appearance. And uh, it's sort of seamless. And when I want to enjoy it, I can. And when I don't want to enjoy it, it just disappears. That's it. This was the one watch on your, on your list that I, uh, when I saw it, like I, I gravitated right to it because I, have an affinity for watches of this size as well. Mm. And I couldn't wait to see which which strap that you put on the watch. <laughs> uh, just because, again, from a size perspective, I mean, it definitely has a more retro fit and feel yeah. than, than its larger brethren. Yeah. Connecting back to your experience with restoration of your Calatrava, let's quickly talk about a one-off watch in your collection effectively a one-off, because you sent a 3800 back for service, or was that, pr <laughs> that was before you, or did you send it back to get I that did dial? Not. I was not responsible for that. I do not have the status with Patek to do something like that. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have only bought one modern Patek my entire life, and it was a 5212. I got lucky and I managed to talk a dealer into selling me a 5212. And that's the I love only that. modern Patek I've ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're wondering out there, Mark has a 3800 mid-sized Nautilus with a bizarre zero applique index sunburst anthracite dial, and we will include a picture of that, but that thing is singular. It's basically one of a kind. I think so. In this configuration of like steel, because Philips had a platinum one a while mm -hmm. back, yes. and there's some controversy over whether that was like a, a dial swap or not. Mine is 100% a dial swap, like, but I have the paperwork for the dial swap, which is kind of cool. Um, so it, that dial actually did come from another two-tone 3800 that Patek used to make in very small numbers. Mm -hmm. And the Dauphin hands came from another reference. So it was actually a mashup of like three different references all together. Well, Trizzy, cool. at the time, some of these decisions that a collector could make were actually allowed. Yeah. So like you could, you could if you purchased uh, even a 3940 yeah. or a 3970 yeah. um, back in the 80s, 90s, even up until a point maybe the early 2000s, and you weren't entirely happy with, with the dial that was on the watch, um, you could send the watch in for service and change it out for something, um, something else. Whether it was a dip, but a different dial that was on that particular. Generally, it was a different dial that had come on that configuration. Well, you know, Brian, as a retailer and also a collector, what do you think of that? Yeah, I, again, I think that for for me, like I'm not so concerned if a, if a dial was swapped. Mm. Like I think that if. If it was done by Patek during a time in which they were doing it, mm. um, and it's an authentic Patek Philippe dial, mm. then I, I see no issue. If mm. it was done after the point, for mm. example, where it wasn't done by them, and it's not something that they would have done, mm. I think that's the point at which mm. I, take, I take issue with it. Yeah, because I guess at that point, you can't even really document it properly either. Correct, and, yeah. and most of these changes can be documented uh, in an archive. Mm. I do think it's something that should be earned, though. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that if you start doctoring every watch that comes in by request, uh, the core reference loses a lot of its allure and its appeal. And mm -hmm. I think part of Patek's success is creating one design that has enough appeal that people don't feel any need to change it. They want that one iconic shape and look. Yeah. And I think that it's fine to do an occasional concession or favor to a very good client, yeah. because there aren't a whole lot of different ways these days that a manufacturer can show solidarity with a good client. Mm. I mean, saying, okay, I'm gonna let you buy a watch is mm. like, oh, wow, <laughs> that you're really doing me a favor there. <laughs> But changing something to make it more personal, that I can understand. Yeah. But this is, I mean, I think that the, the thing to keep in mind is this is something that's not done today. Mm. 
like you, you cannot go to them and ask them to make the changes that were done from the past. And I think that it's, it's also like viewing it from the lens of back then, mm. watch collecting or the watch world as we know it was not the same. It was a very private thing. It, it, was, it was more private. Mm. Um, I think that, again, it was more localized. Mm. Like the internet wasn't at obviously pervasive. And so um, you tend to have a more intimate relationship mm. both with the retailer and the brand itself. And, mm. and a lot of the collectors that were purchasing, whether it was, uh, and we'll talk about it in a second, the mm. 3970 that you purchased from us. Mm. I mean, that was the upper echelon of what the brand was producing at the time. Mm. And so if you were ordering it, were you the owner of a 3970 mm. back then? I mean, you were you were the the owner of one of the more complicated watches that mm. the band was producing. And so it it wasn't far fetched for you to go in and say I've had this watch for several years. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm having a little bit of difficulty reading it. Like I'd like mm. to transition into the to the silver stick dial. Yeah. That was also available, you know, at the time. Yeah. And um it it wasn't it wasn't as big a deal back then, and it wasn't something that, um, honestly, like most collectors really even thought of as being a big yeah. deal. You would have expected the brand to yeah. to switch the dial up for you. Yeah, it's like an element of customer service, yeah. really. Yeah. Speaking of visibility, I have a funny story for you. So, a um, friend of mine in Japan had the very first ellipse, right? And the very first ellipses, the hour and the minute hands were sort of similar in length, so sometimes it was hard to tell what the time was, because you couldn't tell which one was the hour and the minute. And so it's a white dial, golden ellipse, and he had his watchmaker paint the tip of the hour hand so that it looked visually just a little bit shorter. And that's how he got over his visibility problem. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit aftermarket, I don't know. <laughs> I thought the story was gonna end with he then got a personal ellipse no. where, 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 where they did that for him. Philippe Stern personally delivered. So now you've got a large collection of vintage timepieces, some of which are Patek Philippe. The thing about vintage is that you can't always get what you want because it's not always on the market. Mm -hmm. Are there any ongoing searches for watches that you either weren't satisfied with the quality of what was available or you just haven't seen the opportunity? You know, it's funny. I've never been that bothered about quality. I think at the end of the day, if the quality matches up with the price, I can live with it. And if anything, I'd rather buy something that's a little bit off of perfect so that I don't feel so nervous wearing it than paying the premium to get perfect but forcing myself to never wear it or to have to baby it. That so would drive me crazy. To make this a little bit more concrete, you have a 1526 perpetual calendar, mm. which is a legendary reference, but you've been very vocal about it not being, quote, a great example. Oh, it's definitely not a great example. I actually dropped off at Restoration <laughs> just last month, so I'll let you know a couple years later how that goes. <laughs> but the price was right. You saw the opportunity yeah. to get one of the 210 made that you could actually wear without, you know, being too concerned about it, without oh, yeah. thinking about your wrist. Oh, yeah. Do you feel more at ease wearing the watch out as a result? Absolutely. If I had something mint, I don't think... I mean, like even this 4675, I bought this factory sealed, and it, it did take me a couple of weeks just to decide to cut the seal. Right. And then after I cut the seal and I've worn it around, I've gotten used to it, but it definitely made me very nervous initially. There's a wonderful discretion to these older watches. They weren't built mid-size. They weren't built for men or women. They were just built traditionally, and that resulted in a very wearable watch. Mm. Is there anything in the current Patek catalog that interests you given the move towards complication and size? I mean, I love most Pateks. I just wish they were all 30 to 50% smaller. So, just it's the si so it's the size more than anything else. It's the that, size more than that anything else. That sort of dictates. Yeah. Because they're, listen, they're, they're great watches. They're just not physically suitable for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's a fair reason to say this is a bad watch. No, of course not a bad watch. It's just not a watch for you. you know, that's life. Not everything in the world is for you. No, I agree with you. Grandmaster Chime, awesome watch. Yeah. I'd have to wear it around my bicep, but yeah. great watch. Can you imagine they made a Grandmaster Chime in 35 millimeters? It would be wild. It would well, be think, so amazing. I mean, one of the things, though, that I love... Also about, physically impossible, but wild. Shrinking machine. Yes. That I love about the brand is, at least in the minute repeaters, I mean, again, some of the other references, is that they pride themselves on trying to produce minute repeaters as small as possible. Yes. Because the complexity is infinitely greater the smaller the watch gets. Yes. And, and that's where I think that the brand shines, is that at, even though, let's say, watches that are trending up in size and they're probably falling now somewhere between, let's call it 39 and 42 millimeter, mm -hmm. when, when the game is on and, it's, and, and, and the competition of producing the best thing that can be produced mm. is there, is 
they will trend smaller yeah. because of the complexity associated with going smaller. You know, the nice thing about the 90s, too, is that it really was the only era where you had a profusion of Patek complications. They always mm. had a few in the catalog, but it was the only era where you had both those traditional sizes and a profusion of complications. Mm. You had watches like the 5016 that gave you a perpetual calendar and a minute repeater and a tourbillon, the 3940. You know, you had all sorts of perpetual calendar chronograph options, the 5004 split second perpetual. Or oh, just the fact that they made the 3970 smaller than the previous generation. I mm. thought that was a very interesting flex. Yeah. Do you think that's- And so that's actually going back to your point too about just like the challenge of making these things smaller. Correct, mm -hmm. and, but back then in the 90s, I think that there was an element of, again, you have, when you take a lens of the time, like all of the brands were separate. Mm. So Vacheron was its own brand, mm. you know, um, IWC, the, like the, the groups really had informed in the way that they are today. And mm. so there was, and it was back when, when competition was almost fiercest, mm. where like every brand wanted to produce to the best that they could produce and they wanted to take out the other guy. Mm. And I just think that, this like it was more zero sum, you mean? Yes, mm. and I, I think that, and and again, it was, the, and the brands were almost competing more, I think, intently against each other, right? Mm. Like you almost felt like there was more competition as opposed to doing what you're gonna do, mm. uh, almost just to do it. But, mm. um, and I think that at the, at this point, this is when again, when they went smaller, was a because sizing was trending down during that era, but also to be able to take something at that complicated and put it into such a compact size was difficult. Yeah. You know, the challenge is that there have always been traditionalists' watches in the catalog. There have always been watches like the 5124, it's a little mm. bit more compact, uh, the 5196, but it doesn't seem like they're leading the charge anymore. A watch like that in the 1980s would have been in magazine ads, it would have been in movies, it would have mm. been considered a flagship piece. Mm. Today, it seems like Patek is looking to do two things. One, make sportier watches, like mm. the Steel 5905, mm. and also democratize complications with watches like the 5326, where you've got an annual calendar, an automatic winding, and a second time zone. Mm. Uh, but the watch is very big, and maybe elegance suffers a little bit. Do you think it's related to access to watchmakers? As in, it's easier to make larger movements so why not make the case bigger to, so that we can lower the standard that we require for watchmakers? I don't think it's so much the standard. I think it's more that tastes have changed mm. and that as the consumer has gravitated to wanting to be able to wear a watch all the time mm. as opposed to on a specific occasion, like you don't hear mm. as often like that's my black tie watch, Yes. right? And that's my work watch and this sure. is my watch that I'm gonna wear sure. to the beach. You know watches tend to have to fulfill multiple duties now. Yeah. And I think that as demand for, let's call it Aquanaut and Nautilus has taken off in recent years, mm -hmm. um, and sportier watches in general, because it's been a long time coming, um, I think that you had for a while this like big gap between those types of watches and then what else was in the line. So if you look at, let's say the 5159, which is a very traditional office style, officer style case back, mm. like retrograde, guilloche dial. I mean, it's like you would close your eyes and you think that like this is like your grandfather's watch. Yeah. Like this is what Patek Philippe is, yeah. right? You know, it was almost two different buyers yeah. for those types of pieces. Yeah. And I just think that, as Tim mentioned, the watches that are being produced today uh, are a little bit more modern, a little bit more casual. And yeah. I think trying to bridge that divide that the same buyer is open to buying everything. Yeah. And that it's not really pigeonholing people into one particular. Yeah. I mean, you can make a similar argument for clothing too, especially over the last few years. The, what we would call our work wardrobe versus our casual wardrobe is really like melded into one for better or worse. Um, in fact, I, I think that we are, over the next couple of years, gonna have to start thinking about how to extricate ourselves from that. Because at the end of the day, people need to show up to work looking professional. So it's like, what are the garments? What are the details that that cue up your clothing to be professional. But going back to sizing, yes, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's definitely a, a, a fashion trend, a zeitgeist towards larger, sportier watches. Mm -hmm. But for me, what is frustrating is that sometimes watches are just too big for certain people. It's like me having Couldn't a clothing store. It's like me having a clothing store and not having size small. And it's like, so what happens to all those guys who need to wear a size small? 
Like, what do they do? I'm going to take up your challenge. You mentioned that there was perhaps an ease of assembly that comes with larger watches mm. and larger movements. I do think it's fair to say there's that old expression in cycling. It, it applied to the doping era, uh, cyclisme de vitesse. You have cycling at two speeds. I think Patek has watches that are designed for mass production. And, you know, for example, like this movement, the 28520. Mm -hmm. This was created for the 5960 and the 5980. Mm -hmm. Before this, Patek Philippe chronographs were precious things, made no more than maybe 250 pieces per metal per mm -hmm. year. Like, we know the names of all the references. They're very special. They auction for a lot of money today. But in the era of the automatic 28520, we've seen many, many chronographs from Patek Philippe with automatic winding, flyback capability, and that same movement base that started in the 5960. Absolutely. It's funny how versatile this movement is and how many watches across their different product lines it's been in. But it shows you how small it can be. Yeah. I think like right? that's that's the one thing that that honestly like once I saw this watch on your list uh, and I and I had it on my wrist, I'm like I'm like this size like does make sense. Like they should have totally. they should have a watch that's this size totally. even with this kind of complication totally. in, in the in the arsenal. And just sell it as a unisex watch. Why not? Well, I think you're going to see a lot less talk of ladies' watches and a lot more talk of midsize. And that's at Patek, but that's generally, too. Mm. Also, talking about things like accessorization, typically, back in the 1980s, you know, you'd have, like, your 3119 Patek, and you'd wear it with your business suit, you'd wear it to church, things like that. It was always to accent the ensemble. Today, mm -hmm. we have people walking around in shorts and T-shirts mm -hmm. with... Uh, you know, minute repeaters that have complex calendars and sometimes externally visible tourbillon. Mm. We're now in this era where the watch overpowers everything else and there's mm. an aesthetic imbalance. Is this something you've seen? Yeah, it's definitely something I see. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like, I think it depends on the person, it depends on the occasion. Mm. Like, to the point where I'm... I would never generalize about that situation. I'm wearing the watch and I'm asking myself, how do I accessorize my watch rather than the other way around? Mm. Like, what do I wear today with this watch? Because it's the watch that's going to make the difference. Mm. But, you know, I think there's something kind of charming about people who love a watch so much that they're like, whatever, I'm just going to put everything in my life together around this watch. There's something kind of, kind of charming about that, too. Oh, I've you done it. You're a real fan. I know, right? I've done it. <laughs> I've been cool. that guy. I think it's cool, too. Because I put on my watch at the end of at the end of me dressing myself, not at the beginning of me dressing myself. Some people do it other ways, but that's how I do it. Is there anything you'd like to see from Patek Philippe other than smaller cases? Is there anything that you feel they haven't they haven't probed in their history or because the they're watching this and they may make it for you? If you're watching this, um, my dream watch is. Although I need, I think it's my dream watch. I have yet to handle one. I think my dream watch is the Patek Seven Thousand. The just plain rose gold ladies minute repeater where the movement fits exactly in the case. And apparently it's got an amazing sound. I'm dying to see one. And maybe one day that's like the watch for me. But we'll see. No, I, I, I love the 3800, you know, and I hope they bring that back in some way. I would love to see a travel time 3800, you know, with the pushers on the left so you can end a second hour hand. I think oh, that would be, be cool. Yeah, I think that'd be super cool. So here's a question. You've got a pretty extensive collection, not all of which is represented here. And the Titanic's going down, you can save just one. Is there a single Patek in your collection that means so much to you, it would be the one you'd pick, the indispensable watch? Oh, that's so hard. That's such a hard question to answer. Okay. Narrow it down to three, and then we'll do two, and then we'll do one. We'll take that if journey. It was, if it was three, um, definitely the 96 would be on the list. Um, this one next to the 4675, this is a 2533. This is one of the best designs of anything I've ever seen. I'm so in love with this watch, I can't even tell you. I just think this is incredible. Also an historically important yes, piece. Yes, historically important. Um, this is the successor to the 565, which a lot of people, myself included, did not even know existed. They made, I think, about 300 of these. And, um, you know, I love the 565, but I think fundamentally the 565 case design has some problems. Like, I think they were trying to mash together some sort of sporty aesthetic with um, a Calatrava aesthetic, and they came close, but... I don't find the 565 the perfect watch. I find it the I find it to be the inspiration to the perfect watch, but it's not the perfect watch. I think this though, this is really a very sophisticated and developed piece of design that addresses the issues of the 565. And it has magnificent fastening, the lugs, the bezel, even the lug tips. Yeah. It's razor sharp. Yours is in great shape. Yeah. So I can see why that would be one of your three. Okay, now we have to go down to two. Of those three, you have to pick two Pateks to keep. We well, have the emotional you know I'll investment tell you what, in 96. Because, Brian, you were talking about sizes too, right? Since I'm not wearing suits as much, 
I would want a slightly larger watch, so I would probably pick that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're God. down. We're down to our two, and then I guess it just worked out this way. But the the last two are the ones uh, on. Oh, the I wouldn't actually even put this in the three. Oh, that wouldn't be in the three. Okay. Yeah. Boom. I mean, I love that. But Done. Because we have the thirty nine seventy not present, and the thirty nine forty yeah. also not present. So I not do love the thirty nine seventy, and the thirty nine seventy. If I had to travel around with one watch, I I could see it being the thirty nine seventy. It's pretty cool. In the white dial, especially. It's pretty cool. I don't think we're going to get down to that one watch. But I think we've resolved your, your favorites. You've got the 3970. You've got this lovely 2533. And then, of course, you've got the Breguet numeral and restored 96. I mean, I'll throw one more in the mix. I have a 3418. So 3418 is like the unknown cousin to the 3417, the anti-magnetic. Yes. But it has an integrated bracelet, sort of integrated Steel, mesh right? bracelet. Steel, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I really love that thing. That thing's really cool. Every time I put on, I'm like, oh, it's only about a hundred of those, right? It's a very Sorry. rare watch. Yeah, there aren't that many. They weren't. They were very unpopular too. That's my thing. I like unpopular rare things. That's my deal. So, Mark, if folks want to find you in person and online, where do they look? In person, I'll usually be at one of my stores, so either in New York or Hong Kong or sometimes London. And uh, online, I'm Instagram at markcho.com. On behalf of the Watchbox, myself, Brian, and Mark, this has been Perpetually Patek, and thanks for logging on. Thanks, guys. Thanks for Thank having me. Yeah, of course. It.